Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space News Roundup. This for the week of the 20th to 26th of September, 2021. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host, Jean Deville. Before getting into this week's news updates, a special shout out to our good friends at spacewatch.global and Go Taikonauts, two excellent sources of space industry news. And a kind reminder that if you have not done so already, to check out the Dongfang Hour newsletter at newsletter.dongfanghour.com. This week, we bring you an interesting CGTN documentary about China's manned space program. We bring you yet another update from launch startup Space Pioneer. But first, Jean will bring us into an update on the Tianzhou mission and the Hainan space sector more generally. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. So, Sean, Tianzhou 3 seemed like a pretty big deal this week. What was going on over in Wenchang? Really a lot of stuff. So on Monday, September the 20th, we saw the launch of the Tianzhou 3 cargo spacecraft from the Wenchang Launch Center in the southern island of Hainan on board a Long March 7 rocket. And this is only the second Tianzhou cargo spacecraft to be sent to the Chinese space station after the first cargo uh, spacecraft, the Tianzhou 2, earlier this year in May 2021. And so um, the launch took place successfully in what seems to be a routine now with all of the multiplication of number of launches to the Chinese space station. And if we cover what happened in a chronological order, first we had rocket ignition that took place at 10 past 3 p.m. Beijing time. And as the rocket increasingly gained speed, uh, we saw the side boosters separate, followed by the first stage and at last the second stage at T plus 597 seconds, a point at which the Tianzhou 3 was then on its own in low Earth orbit. And worth noting at the time, while uh, the Tianzhou 3 was inserted into the correct orbit, the mission was not yet considered to be a full success. And to have that basically the uh, the ground control in Beijing waits for um, the solar arrays and the relay antenna to deploy completely. And that's because the, the solar array and the antenna are basically folded up when the Tianzhou cargo spacecraft is fitted into the payload fairing because there's only that much volume available in a payload fairing on a rocket. And so that then eventually happened successfully. Uh, the deployment was completed roughly 10 minutes later after the separation of the second stage. And after that, Tianzhou 3 then docked successfully with the Tianhe 1 core module of the Chinese space station about six and a half hours later in what the Chinese called Kuai Su Jia Hui Dui Jie, or fast rendezvous and docking. And in total, the four orbital control engines at the back of the Tianzhou cargo spacecraft were fired uh, about six times or six uh, corrections. And they also had assistance during the entire trip from the 32 attitude control um, engines. And the rapid pace of the rendezvous I just mentioned, six and a half hours, this was made possible uh, thanks to the Beidou 3 um, SatNav constellation, which SatNav services have been operational since 2020. And we know that Tianzhou 3, but also the Tianzhou 2, have been making extensive use of its SatNav services. We also know that this fast rendezvous was enabled by the increased computing power of the Tianzhou 3. Um, also of the uh, Tianhe 1 core module of the Chinese space station. All this plays an instrumental role uh, during the rendezvous process. And finally, I believe that the launch uh, window of the Long March 7 was selected very carefully to make sure that basically the Tianzhou 3, when it was inserted into or orbit by the rocket, it was already more or less in a correct orbit. So there was um, you know, much fewer corrections uh, to be done compared to what was done previously, or at least that's how it was explained, I believe, on, on, on the live stream of CCTV. And to give you a point of comparison, the Tianzhou 3, uh, it took, what, six and a half hours for the Tianzhou 3 to complete the docking, but it took eight hours for the Tianzhou 2 earlier this year, and it took two to three days for the first generation Tianzhou cargo spacecraft called the Tianzhou 1, uh, which took place in 2017 when it was docking with the Tiangong 2 experimental space station. So definitely quite a, quite an upgrade and quite a difference between the first and second generation Tianzhou spacecraft. Um, now, a question could be, 
what did the Tianzhou 3 carry, right? It's a cargo spacecraft and unsurprisingly carried lots of supplies for the upcoming Shenzhou 13 crew that's bound to be launched uh, in October. And they'll be staying six months on board the Chinese space station, which is an unprecedented record um, for the Chinese space program. I think the, I mean, the previous record was already set just a couple of months mm -hmm. ago uh, by the uh, Shenzhou 12 crew uh, that returned in September um, this year. Uh, it's worth noting that the absolute world record is actually still held by cosmonaut Valery Polyakov, who stayed 437 days in the Mir uh, space station. So that was probably in the late 90s. And on the side of the ISS, the record will be held by U.S. astronaut Mark Van de Hey when he returns to Earth next year from the International Space Station, at which point I think he'll have stayed 350 or, or three, well, basically one year on board the International Space Station. Now, back to the cargo of the Tianzhou 3, there will be over 200 packages representing five tons ish of cargo with 2.16 tons dedicated specifically to supplies for the uh, three Taikonauts. And that's 500 kilograms more than um, what was brought uh, in the Tianzhou 2 cargo spacecraft a couple of months prior. And it's uh, to be expected as the Shenzhou 13 crew will be staying a longer amount of time on board the CSS. And we know that among all of that, there will be one ton that will be dedicated specifically just you know for bringing water up to the Chinese space station. Now, among the other equipment, so beyond the 2.16 tons, we also know that there was a space EVA suit, and this is because the Chinese space station currently only has two on board, and both are generally used simultaneously during an EVA, so there was no backup, so that's what this extra suit is for. We know that there are experimental space sciences payloads, including seeds for biology experiments, and there's also equipment linked to the maintenance and the overhaul of the uh, space station. And last but not least about this launch a couple of days ago, I want to mention that there was a really good coverage, both in English on CGTN, but also in Chinese on uh, CCTV. And as has been the case in previous editions in 2020 and 2021, um, CCTV invited uh, on board some really quality guest speakers from the Chinese space industry. So generally, it's people from the Chinese Academy of Launch Technology or the Chinese Academy of Science and Technology. So people that are directly involved in the space program. And this really makes the live coverage a goldmine of information. This uh, live coverage also gave us uh, some glimpse of some non-technical stuff, such as the excitement that was uh, generated in China by the launch. And there were glimpses of, um, you know, the Qishui Wan Beach, which is just opposite of the Wenchang Launch Center, which was ab absolutely packed with people. And this is quite an unusual sight for Wenchang because generally, you know, it's just a small and quiet city on the southern island of Hainan. Um, and I think this excitement was quite in contrast with um, space-related discussions outside of China, because in China, there's a lot of talk about Tianzhou 3 and Shenzhou 12 naturally. But outside of China, the attention was mostly focused on the Inspiration 4 mission, which brought a crew of four private citizens into LEO um, on board a SpaceX Crew Dragon. I think Inspiration 4 did not happen exactly at the same time. It was three or four days prior, I believe. Um, but, you know, yeah. Just the discussions were mostly focused on that outside of China, naturally, because this is also quite an unprecedented mission. Um, so, yeah, that's for the in-depth coverage of Tianzhou 3. Now, um, do we, Blaine, do you want to unzoom a little bit and just tell us about the Hainan Space Cluster in general? Sure thing. And indeed, this is perhaps slightly unfortunate timing for the Chinese space program, given that the world does still have a finite amount of appetite for space-related news. So to have it time up so well with a couple of other pretty big events is, um, you know, tough luck, I suppose. Um, but anyway, during the week, in uh, also in Wenchang, we saw a couple of other things uh, going on. Um, so an article from September 21st published by Xinhua dug a little bit more into the 2021 Wenchang International Aviation and Aerospace Forum, or the 2021 Wenchang Guoji Hangkong Hangtian uh, Luntan. Uh, and so basically this event was looking at the, the space sector in Wenchang and in Hainan province more generally and discussing ways that they could be continuing to develop the, the space sector. Uh, and so just to review a little bit, uh, so Hainan province is an island off of the southern coast of China. As a relatively less developed province, Hainan has historically been home to primarily agriculture and food processing and other light industries. In recent years, we've seen some efforts by the provincial government and also the national government to upgrade the island's economy and infrastructure. And a very small part of this has been the Wenchang Space Launch Center on the eastern part of the island. And this, uh, to Jean's earlier point, it includes not only the launch site, but some tourist facilities uh, and also a pretty epic Hilton Hotel. And as we've covered in the Dongfang Hour episode 31, uh, this 
this pop culture phenomenon, this pilgrimage of, of tourists, this has certainly helped uh, to bring a lot more people to Hainan and I suppose to have a lot more economic development there. Um, but that being said, Wanchang, the Space Launch Center, has only done uh, 14 launches over the five years uh, since it opened. So around one launch every four months, about three launches per year. And so this means that the economic impact, the the contribution to the space economy of the provinces is relatively small in the grand scheme of things. Now, granted, this is going to accelerate a little bit in 2022 and 2023, as there are going to be more heavy lift launches required for the Chinese space station. But overall, it seems that uh, the province and, and the government more generally is of the belief that the Wanchang Space Launch Center, while a very nice piece of space industry infrastructure, is not enough to sustain a whole space economy on Hainan and in Wanchang. So they would like to see more uh, more things being built in, uh, in the province. Um, and so at the moment, separate to Wanchang, you have a Chinese Academy of Sciences TTNC facility in Sanya on the southern part of the island. And as we've discussed in the Dongfang Hour episode 42, at a provincial level, we've started to see an increase in diversification of the space sector. And this is happening also at a national level through the NDRC and through the Ministry of, uh, of Commerce or MAFCOM. Uh, and this is primarily also being done through the, the five-year plans. So emphasized during this week's event was the Wanchang International Aerospace City, which was unveiled in June of 2020 as one of the 11 key industrial parks in the Hainan Free Trade Port. The project up to this point, and this point being the conference this week, had attracted more than 30 entities, including some pretty space industry heavy hitters like CALT and the Aerospace Information Research Center of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. The latter, the Aerospace Information Research Center of the CAS, is notably one of China's leading institutions uh, for SAR technology and may therefore have some degree of relationship or some connection with the Hainan uh, constellation of Earth observation satellites, given that this constellation does have a SAR component. And referring to CALT, the other main space company that is one of the uh, one of the 30 entities, um, their presence in Wanchang presumably is um, part of their involvement with launching some of the larger rockets from the launch site, including the Long March 5 and, and 7. Um, and I would also note that at the conference and also in the Aerospace City, uh, there is also a China rocket presence, a China rocket being a commercial subsidiary of CALT. And so just one last couple of points to uh, to round out the discussion on Wanchang, and then I will turn it over to Jean for the human spaceflight documentary. Um, I would just note the social media coverage that was being done in the city this week. And we saw a couple of pretty epic videos of um, what looked like rather maddening traffic jams, which I guess is what happens when you have a relatively small city infrastructure that is being um, descended upon by a very large number of tourists from the mainland. And I guess I would also point out that the coinciding of the launch somewhat with the Mid-Autumn Festival, I presume a fair number of people that would otherwise maybe not have been able to take some time off were able to uh, take some time off and head down to Wanchang. So uh, that is closing out what was apparently a very big week in uh, Wanchang and for Hainan more generally. Um, so, John, unless you have anything else to add, we can maybe go into the CGTN doc. Absolutely. Um, so sort of in the continuity of discussing the Chinese space program, last week, China's English language channel uh, CGTN revealed a documentary of 44 minutes dedicated specifically on China's crude space program. The documentary really comes at a time where there's increasing international interest for China's space program, naturally in the vicinity of all the recent launches that there have been for the construction of the Chinese uh, space station. And so this documentary, it gives an overview of China's space program from the very early days, you know, the first um, satellite and launches in the 1970 with the Dongfang Hong one satellite and all the way to today. It can be helpful for uh, viewers and listeners who are not that familiar with the general timeline of China's space history over the past four or five decades. But maybe for the more knowledgeable viewer and viewers and listeners, the documentary won't bring too many new insights. So my personal appreciation of this documentary is that Although the narration is definitely given from a Chinese perspective, I think there are nevertheless some excellent and unique insights into, for example, the difficulties that were encountered by the Chinese during the construction of their space program. And some of these, for example, were quality control issues that took place that, that happened in the 1990s and that resulted in some very spectacular and high profile um, launch failures and explosions in the mid 1990s. 
Uh, there was also the Shenzhou 5 window cracking uh, during re-entry. So Shenzhou 5 was the crude capsule that carried Yang Liwei, the first um, Taikonaut to be sent into orbit by China in 2003. And apparently, there were some issues with the window during re-entry. There was also a fire alarm that went off during the first EVA ever performed by China in 2008 by the Shenzhou 7 crew. So overall, I think it's also quite uncommon to see China discussing directly, um, you know, openly its issues with its space program, and especially in an English language uh, media where that's basically destined, I, I would believe, to international viewers. And I think this highlights to some extent the um, increasing confidence that China has in its space program to be able to put on the table issues that they have encountered without any, you know, filtering of information. Although I guess that discussing problems that are affecting uh, the current space program would be another another story entirely. But yeah, overall, it, it does suggest, a, you know, a more open communications for future, um, you know, interactions with the international space community. So I think that's, uh, that's definitely a, a good thing. So um, do check that out if you're interested in Chinese crude spaceflight history. And apart from that, Blaine, I think we're, that's three pieces of news on the Chinese space program. Do you want to tell us also a little bit about um, the commercial space program? Absolutely. And holy cow, that would have been terrifying to be Yang Liwei on Shenzhou 5 <laughs> when, uh, when, the, when the windshield cracked. That would have been something. Um, so this week, uh, we, we have another update from uh, Space Pioneer, also known as Tianbing Aerospace. And we've talked about Space Pioneer quite a lot lately, but that's really because they've just had a pretty impressive number of fairly significant updates over these last few months. And so today, Sunday the 26th, the company announced a strategic investment from a national small and medium enterprise fund, this being the company's seventh invest, uh, seventh round of funding over the last two and a half years, and coming just two months after the company's uh, B series pre-B round of funding, which we discussed on the Dongfang Hour episode 44. Now, having gone pretty in-depth into Space Pioneer on that Dongfang Hour episode 44 from just a couple of months ago, we're going to keep this relatively short, but just a couple of points that I would like to highlight uh, about this uh, timely piece of news. So again, this is Space Pioneer's seventh round of funding over the last two and a half years, and we estimate that they would have raised more than 700 million uh, RMB, so more than 100 million US dollars. As we mentioned a couple of times, uh, the CEO is the former CTO of Land Space, Kang Yong Lai. Also noteworthy within this announcement is the fact that Space Pioneer mentions satellite internet and the demand for a large number of broadband satellites as a sort of selling point for their launch business. And this is not particularly surprising in the sense that, of course, launch companies are targeting constellations. Um, but it's interesting that they seem to have a you know some degree of confidence that they can address such demand as LEO broadband satellites. Second point of interest about the announcement from Space Pioneer is the inclusion of satellite internet from the National Development and Reform Commission in the press release. And this satellite internet is, of course, a reference to China's plans to have a low Earth orbit broadband constellation somewhat similar to Starlink or OneWeb. And the inclusion of this in the press release is possibly an indication that Space Pioneer expects to serve some of this constellation in terms of a as a launch service provider, let's say. Uh, so the last thing I would mention about this round of funding from Space Pioneer and the associated press release is the mention of the Suzhou production park of the company, which broke ground in April of 2021. And so Suzhou being in Jiangsu province in the Yangtze River Delta is home to an increasing number of, um, of facilities for uh, commercial launch companies and, uh, and other related uh, sub subsystems level suppliers. And so just within the Yangtze River Delta, as we've discussed on previous episodes, you have uh, companies like Deep Blue Aerospace, Land Space, Rocket Group, and also arguably Jiuzhou Yunjian, if you were to include uh, Bengbu in Anhui province as part of the YRD, which many people would not. Um, and this is all in addition to SAST, which is also a very large launch service provider in the Yangtze River Delta, you know, Shanghai primarily as well. And so again, just this uh, strengthening of what appears to be a pretty large commercial launch cluster in the relative, you know, geographically quite small Yangtze River Delta region. You have quite a lot of launch companies. And again, apparently this seventh round of funding in two and a half years for Space Pioneer will in part be used to develop their facilities over in um, in the Suzhou Industrial Park that they are they are building. Uh, so, Jean, unless you have anything on uh, Space Pioneer or Yangtze River Delta. I think I'm all good for this week. OK, sounds good. And with that, this has been another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space News Roundup. This for the week of the 20th to 26th of September, 2021. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host, Jean Deville. And if you like what you've seen or heard today, 
I encourage you to check out the Dongfang Hour newsletter over at newsletter.dongfanghour.com. And if you've enjoyed this episode and you want to support us, don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment in the comment section below. Also, do check out our new website, which has been entirely updated with a new design and a better user experience. So we'll be posting articles there for our followers that uh, prefer the written word to the audio or video news updates. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next week.